Uh, we want to thank all of you for coming to our event with Peter Klein, who is um, not just a fantastic author, but a real friend of the store. Um, he's been like co doing writers' workshops in the store with the coffee house, as well as the library. Um, he's done events to teach young writers and new writers up in Los Angeles. Um, and now it's back here with us, um, not too far from here. Um, we're just thrilled to have him here for the broken room. Um, every single person who I've seen talk about already is just like incredible action. Can't stop turning the pages. Um, aside from a real thriller, um, it's very poignant. It has um, some issues with the mistreatment of immigrants um, that I think will kind of cut to the heart a little bit. Um, it also has a real strong element of creepiness or cosmic or weirdness, everything that you'd love and expect from the fine book. So please give them a big hand. Cool. I don't know, I could teach this. I don't know. Hi. Um, so I was told if everyone's cool with it, I'm going to take my mask off just so when this airs online, no one redubs it and has me like saying things about Ukraine or something. <laughs> like, oh my God, he's pro Putin. What? <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so, hi. Uh, thank you all for coming. This is the first time I've been in front of an audience in two years, almost exactly. <laughs> um, actually, I was thinking of that coming down that this is literally, I think it was two years ago that I guest hosted the coffee house here for Jonathan Maybury, and then nobody saw anyone again for two years. Um, also, I'm probably going to be a little babbly here for which i apologize um when when we first started talking about this a couple of months back uh when like we're doing early publicity talks for the book um i had thought i would do this with a friend of mine stephen blackmore who's another author who does the eric carter books um and the his new book is out in two weeks which is why we thought it'd be really good so after this go pre-order suicide kings uh and then as we got closer and closer, I got in touch with people and realized like lots of emails had sort of passed back and forth in the wind. And I uh, was very confused about who was doing things. So now I'm here alone and I'm going to try and sound kind of intelligent and not too babbly and whatever. Uh, <laughs> so uh, what I thought I could do was talk a little bit about this book and where it came from, because this is a a different thing for me. Um, most of my books, if any of you have ever read anything of mine before, um, are much more in that like straight sci-fi horror-ish vein. And this is very much uh, more of an action, almost spy thriller at points, uh, which then gets weird and spooky like all my stuff does because I can't ever stay on target. Uh, but it, it was a weird book and it came out of nowhere and I just thought it might be fun to talk about that and where it came from a little bit. Uh, and that and all the babbling uh, means we should probably talk about how much I drink on weekends. And uh, if I don't know if anyone here follows me on social media, but um, on Saturdays, I have an awful habit that has developed over the years of watching really bad B-movies while I build little toy soldiers. Um, and I mean, really bad B movies. I, I would love to say that like there are some gems out there, but the gems are very, very few and far between. Um, and I say this as somebody who worked in the film industry for a long time and got to see a lot of really good directors and storytellers do their thing, uh, and also see a lot of really bad ones at work. Um, and as someone who I like to pretend knows something about storytelling, uh, and so in that sense, all of these movies are very bad and generally take one or four drinks to get through, uh, which I'm told can make the live tweeting much more entertaining at points. Uh, but anyway, uh, a little over two years ago, I was doing one of these Saturday Geekery things and watching this movie, uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure it was a British movie. It's funny that I can only remember certain details of it, not because of the drinking, but... Uh, but essentially, there was a scene, and this woman walks into a pub and looks around and sees this like 
older guy sitting like in the corner booth pounding pints away and all of a sudden like all at once my brain like just sort of exploded on this scene i was like oh my god you know what she's probably here looking for him and he is an ex-spy he's like retired or got forced out or something and she's looking for him because people are chasing her because you know she can do things and her his ex-partner told him that she could find him here but his her his ex-partner is dead and she knows this because she can talk to ghosts and that's why the people want her and so now he's gonna have to come out of retirement to protect and literally all of this happened in my head in like three seconds literally in the time that like in the in the movie this woman walked in we had like the shot to the guy and it was just her like and I knew the entire plot right there, um, except that was not remotely the plot of this movie. Um, it, it just went off in some other direction and did not. But this idea of the, the woman looking for the burned out ex-spy stuck in my head for a long time, uh, even though I was working on another book at the time. This just kept bugging me, kept bugging me. And at one point, it was probably probably about October 2019, if I'm remembering correct. Um, this was crossed my mind again. And the line that came with it was, you know, and then a girl walks into the bar, like a setup for a joke or something. And it suddenly struck me, this is what this is. It's not, a, it's not a woman who's walking into the bar. It's a little girl. It's like, you know, this, 10 year old girl who is looking for this guy who is talking to his dead partner um and suddenly like this thing was the idea that had been nagging at me was now screaming at me like oh my god you have to write this you have to write this you have to write this and like any good responsible writer i immediately discarded the thing i was working on and decided to spend a weekend and just pound it out like the first four chapters of this um right up to like like all the setup and all the stuff up to the first big fight scene which you will hopefully get to read i'm assuming no one here has read it yet um but i got all this out and because it came out like so fast like that i was then immediately convinced wow this must be garbage um and i spent like another week or so fretting over it and so then i showed it to my partner who is also a writer and said is this garbage and she's like no, no, this is actually really good. I should have took up a writer friends and they looked at it and I was like, is this garbage? And they're like, this is the first draft. You suck. You're awful. Um, so I was like, okay, wow, I guess I'll have to do this. But now as I was kind of thinking about this a little more, it hit the point of, okay, well, if I was going to do this, I need to, like, I need to actually figure out what is this story past little girl talks to a ghost. Um, and you know, so I was trying to like work out backstories and motivations and, you know, everything, like structure the whole story out. And again, like a responsible writer, um, I went on Twitter instead and just sort of browsing stuff. Thank you, internet. Uh, <laughs> and uh, at the time, this was now, you know, very late 2019. And the one common thing we were seeing a lot on the internet was uh you know the border things going on with children being separated from parents and all that and like I'm, I'm not a monster i didn't want this to be a horrible thing but i wanted it to be right like i said okay i could maybe this would work this might do something um and i didn't want it to be me like sort of yelling at the reader through the page of i am making a political statement right here but i also didn't want this to be something that i was making fun of and i didn't want it to be a you know just a joke um so i got in touch with a friend of mine who actually used to report on the border crossing and all that and um she and I uh, talked for a while. We got on Zoom, as was the fashion at the time, because uh, we're now in early 2020. Uh, and we talked for like two hours about what was going on, what, you know, what was actually happening. Because the thing that, that struck me was we kept hearing this phrase about, you know, oh, and these kids are getting lost in the system. 
And I was like, well, what, is, what does this mean? You know, when we're saying these kids are lost in the system. I mean, I, I ordered my partner a t-shirt for Valentine's Day and it's still not here. And that's lost in the system. But I'm pretty sure if someone put their mind to it, they could tell us where the t-shirt is right now. So is it just that no one's going to bother to look for these kids, like for their paperwork? Does it, is there paperwork? What is going on with them? And Brooke, you know, she and I sat down and she told me things she had seen, her experience herself, things she had, you know, heard from other reporters she knew. And it's a pretty awful situation. Um, and it's like notably better now, but it's also the kind of thing where it was so horrible then that it's still pretty awful, even though it's notably better. Um, and you know, I, I know I said a couple of minutes ago, I'm not a monster, but as she's telling me all this, you know, my first thought was, wow, this could be really good for me. I could make this work. Um, so after thinking that and, you know, scouring my skin with salt for two hours or so, um, I sat down and started piecing it all together of, okay, how am I going to make this work? How am I going to do it? Um, and then I just started working on it and I spent man, like the next five, six months working on the first draft, which, um, let's see, that was 2020. Um, I don't know if you, any, any of you remember, noticed the time 2020 was an election year, some stuff went on. Um, and it was also a pandemic year and it was also the year of black lives matter and it was the it was a, a crap year to try and focus on anything and write a book uh so that took a long time and and the whole time also it's hammering home to me of is this going to seem very shallow now is this going to seem bad because the this may come as a shock. I don't know if, if we're broadcasting video uh, <laughs> or audio, but I am a, a getting close to middle-aged white guy. And I'm not going to be like, oh, let me now tell you the real story of what it's like for immigrants on the border. Um, I am not arrogant enough or dumb enough to think that is my story to tell. Um, but it is something I wanted to tell true. And as things were going on and getting worse and worse and worse, I'm like, holy crap, is can I even have this as an element anymore um, without it just seeming trite or weird or, or overly political? Because at some point, anyone's going to think it's political when you're doing it. Um, so finally got a first draft done, got a second draft done, which is then my draft when I start calling all my friends. Because for me, the first draft is the total messy thing where I will skip over a lot of stuff and you know, have notes of like, ask Ellen how to break into cars or, you know, make this not suck. So, <laughs> um, which you laugh, but these are like all honest notes that I leave for myself. Um, so I did all that. Then I did another pass. At some point in there, I had, um, weird fun fact, uh, this might be hard to believe, but there are, uh, firearm enthusiasts in the world who love going through books and movies and TV shows and sort of pointing out everything that is wrong with it, that they will leave the angry view of, I was really enjoying it until Hector fired 23 shots from a six hour, which as we all know is impossible. And it knocked me out of the book and the book sucks. Um, and I used to work in the film industry. So I actually have a lot of firearms experience. Um, that weird, weird, true story. Um, I'm going to just segue because with that, I feel like I'm talking fast, so I need to fill up time now. <laughs> um, when I worked in the film industry, at one point, I was working on a movie and one of our stand-ins had just returned. He was a Marine and he had just come back from a tour in the Middle East. And at one point at lunch, we ended up talking firearms and comparing notes because he was, um, I don't know if anyone here has served or knows someone who served. I wanted to say he, he was like rated as a weapon specialist, but I know that's not exactly the right term, but he essentially was a weapon specialist for the Marines. And we started comparing notes and realized that I had fired more weapons than him for types of weapons and 
design styles, calibers, everything. And it, it just turned into this whole, like, well, have you ever tried one of these? Have you shot one of those? Have you fired one of these? It's like the, the most masculine conversation I've ever been in, in a weird way. Um, but so anyway, what this amounted to, though, is so I got to like about my third, fourth draft and I did a pass that I, I actually have notes that I called it my bullet pass, where I would actually sit down with a scratch pad and for every action scene, I was like, OK, first two shots at that guy and then three she takes these kills these three guys. But that guy gets two shots. So now he's got seven rounds left in the pistol and then he does this. And basically did an entire pass where all I did was keep track of Hector's ammunition at any given point in the book. Uh, and I had actually done a similar thing. Uh, I had a book that came out a couple of years ago called Dead Moon, and there's one firearm scene in it, uh, a zombie killing scene. And I had the exact same thing that I sat down and like, okay, he kills that zombie, that zombie, one round hits the floor. That round hits. Um, so I did like the, the crazy gun pass and got all that right. Um, and then I felt good about it. I'd shown it some beta readers, they liked it. Uh, I recut some stuff, I think somewhere in there. Um, this book originally had, when hopefully you all read it, uh, there are originally many more points of view in this. And I at one point realized, well, I don't need this one. And I don't need this scene from that one. And then the more I thought about it, I was like, I could probably cut all of these and it would be fine. And I did. Um, so that's where it was, and I sent it off to my agent. Um, now, the funny thing is, if you remember, I, I told you at the beginning that I'd been working on another book. So over the past six months, whenever my agent and I would talk, and I would be like, oh, the book's coming fine, the book's going great. I had never told him I had like dumped that book and was now writing something else altogether. So he like he got the book, and he's like, yeah, I got to like deal with this and this first. And like two weeks passed, and he finally sat down to read it. And I think he got about four or five chapters into it. And he called me up and he's like, this isn't the time travel book, is it? And I'm like, oh, no, it's not. No, I, I wrote something else. Is that okay? He's like, yeah, I'm liking it so far. So, <laughs> um, And then he read it and he had some notes and thoughts. And I, I know a lot of people, you can easily find people online ranting about it. And then my agent said I had to do this. My editor said I had to do this. My agent is a smart guy. Um, and he said, well, I think this, and I think that like this bit starts on a little long and maybe you need a little something here. And, you know, I was very mature about it and nodded a lot on the phone call and then hung up and my partner had to listen to me yell for a little bit. It was like, nah, I just know what I'm trying to do here. And then I settled down. I was like, no, he's right. He's right about this and this. And he and I got back on the phone and talked some things. So, um, I won't tell you which one, but there's actually one chapter in the middle of this book that I literally just dropped in. Um, and if you can't tell, it means I did a good job. Uh, <laughs> maybe in a couple months, I'll reveal which one. Uh, but we did all that and then took it out. And here we are today. Um, it was a really weird book to write. I'm really happy with it. Uh, I'm trying to think of like other fun things. I was, when I was making notes and thinking about like, okay, stuff I want to talk about with this. Like, oh, I can talk about that. No, crap, that's kind of spoilery. Can't talk about that. Okay, but I can tell people, no, no, that'll give stuff away. Um, it doesn't tell you anything, sort of. But if you've read any of my other books, you'll probably catch an Easter egg or nine in this. Um, I'm trying to think what else fun thing I could tell you, random facts. Um, probably the only other thing I think is not really a huge spoiler is that uh, Natalie, one of our two main characters, is actually named after uh, actor, director Natalie Morales, um, who you might know from The Middleman. Uh, she had two movies come out over the pandemic, uh, Plan B and uh, Language Lessons. And I would originally was calling the character Alejandra and it wasn't really catching for some reason in my head. And it also, um, I was hitting problems with it as far as um, dealing with other characters and how the names would line up. Uh, and then I 
turn Twitter on again. You know, the dodge problem. Uh, thank you, Internet, again. <laughs> um, and literally, tur literally turned on Twitter, and Natalie Morales was posting stuff right there. And I was like, Natalie, that's a great name. Um, and that is how Natalie got her name. Um, and man, I'm trying to think. I think the only other thing worth telling, and this is my other one little fun story, is this fantastic cover. Um, as I mentioned, my agent is really good. Uh, he's a smart guy, good guy. He gets me all sorts of approval things that are in my contract that I get like cover approval, cover input, all this sort of stuff. And I really appreciate this, that he does this. At the same time, I also know that like, I have a nephew who has better graphic design skills than me. He can, he can do more on Minecraft than I can do in the real world. So the, the folks at Blackstone came to me like, so what do you think for a cover? What do you think? Was, ah, I don't really know. I'm not the guy to ask. And then they asked anyway, and they kept asking. And so I was like, I don't know. I had like this kind of idea, but maybe something like this, maybe kind of wash it out a little, do something weird. And so we went through, I think, nine different versions of the cover uh, with them trying to follow notes I had given or notes they thought I had given because as things got passed to the actual designer artist, like, you know, there was like little tweaks and adjustments and everything. And really the, the cover sort of went ahead leaps and bounds when I finally said, you know, guys, I think I'm, I'm not really, I shouldn't be involved in any of this. Please stop asking me. <laughs> um, and they stopped, and a week later, the uh, cover designer said, well, what about this? And just, bam, turned this in. And we're like, that's gorgeous. Um, and I'm super, super happy with it as considering, uh, again, if any of you follow me, you know, my last two books were not physical. Um, I had exclusive audio deals that became ebook deals. Um, this is just such a friggin' beautiful book to get to come back to bookstores with. I am so happy. Um, and now I think we've hit the, I am really blabbing a lot phase of this. Um, I could answer questions. I could tell the story about the little carnival in my town. So that is actually one of the questions that the internet is asking. <laughs> um, so let me pull it up here. Just so I can get the name. Uh, Matt Ramsey asked. Can you tell us about the old amusement park in the center of your town when you were growing up? Actually, if you look, though, I told Matt Ramsey, no. <laughs> no, Matt, I see you through the lens. Um, yes, I grew up in a little tiny uh, coastal town. Uh, we, we were, I was talking about this with Robert here before we started. Um, I, I grew up in this little town, and, and this book kind of touches on this, that when you're little, you don't know things are abnormal when you're a little kid, there's a certain point in your life when you start to realize like, oh, most other families don't do this. Oh, most other towns aren't like this. Um, I grew up in this very little, very old New England town. Um, and one of the things was because it's a coastal town, it was a vacation town. So much of the town, I think my mom told me at one point, two thirds of the town's population leaves for winter. Um, so if you're there like during school time, the population is like, or was at the time, like four or 5,000. Um, and we had an amusement park in town. Uh, the amusement park was literally behind our house that I grew up with like a house with a backyard and a forest. Like if I looked out my bedroom window, there were trees right there. And if you went about half a mile into the forest, you would hit the back of the amusement park. And it had a fence that was probably shorter than this podium I am standing at, um, which is definitely something that could stop a bunch of 11 year old kids who wander out into the woods to go explore the carnival in the middle of winter or the amusement park. Um, and again, when I was a kid growing up, I just thought this was normal. Probably everyone grows up in a weird little town with an amusement park and, you know, the creepy. And it was like a real amusement park that. We, we don't think of this anymore because I think we all have gotten used to like the rides that all fold up into a, you know, into a semi truck so they can drive it away. Um, York's Wild Kingdom had actual standing attractions. They had like a standing haunted house. They had a standing fun house. They had an actual roller coaster, all this stuff. So if you wandered around there in the winter, 
with like you know all the leaves blowing across the path and everything as you walked around um yeah it could be a little creepy but again i just thought everyone grew up with this and i'm sure it had no effect on me whatsoever so um <laughs> but um, um Comment, by the way, I wanted to share with you. Oh. When you mentioned Saturday, Saturday E3, yes. uh, the chat went wild. <laughs> um, one person said, Ellen sounds cool. We all need a friend and that can break into cars. I am, I am super fortunate that I have a bunch of friends, like people I've known since college, people I have met along the way. I have easily on speed dial. I have a biochemist. I have a genetic engineer. Um, I have new people from almost every branch of the military, uh, who have done a large variety of things. Um, my dad in the course of his life has basically served on a submarine. He's been a radiation specialist who works in like nuclear reactors. Um, he then, okay, this sums up my dad. So my mom finally got my dad to retire. And they were down in Galveston at the time, Galveston, Texas, where they had a tall ship. So for retirement, my dad decided he was going to go volunteer on the tall ship. And I pointed out, so let me get this straight. Your idea of retirement is to do the thing the British Navy used to get people drunk and kidnap them for. And this is what you want to do for fun now that you're older. <laughs> um, he also uh, got bored with that after a while and started working with a train museum and help me out. I wrote a book a couple of years back called Paradox Bound, which if you've read it, trains figure into. And my dad helped me a ton with that. Um, he, he is literally, okay, I can point to like numerous things in my book as like just having an expert on hand. Uh, if you remember in, again, if you've read these, in uh, Expatriates, one of my books, Barry gets held in a nuclear reactor. My dad helped me work that out. How would you do this? Um, in Paradox Bound, he helped me with um, how would you like, how would you do this for a train? How would you do this? Um, and, and filling me in on a lot of things were like, oh, well, you know, we all thought this, like, uh, weirdly enough, my birthday, May 31st is this day they called the grand unification. And it was the day that all the train tracks in America switched to the same gauge so that now like you could actually run trains cross country instead of having to stop in kansas city because the tracks got six inches wider there or something except this is actually kind of a lie and it took like decades after that for everyone <laughs> to keep, like this was symbolically when we said okay from now on nobody makes train tracks any other size except for that one maybe those and, um and he actually pointed out that they there were trains that were variable gauge that then they were making trains that could actually switch how far apart their wheels were it's like, oh, I'm so using that. <laughs> so. Uh, Tim Martin, who has a great comment saying Peter Klein Theater, I would watch that. <laughs> also poses a question How do you personally gauge the success of your novels? I just assume they're all failures. That's um, <laughs> just from horrible childhood insecurity. Um, I don't know. I mean, the only novel I think of that I, I consider. And I don't know if it's sort of a failure, but that I, at least I know like this did not work out well financially was my second novel was a mashup novel. Um, and it was, uh, some of you may know, The Eerie Adventures of the Lycanthrope Robinson Crusoe. Um, I think even to date, maybe 15 people have read it. And um, it was a book with an incredibly low advance. The rights reverted to me before the advance earned out. So let's put it that way. <laughs> um, and it was not a big advance at all. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, but at the same time, I love that book and I'm super proud of that book uh, and what I got to do with it. So, I mean, I don't know. It's, it's how do you, how do you say if something is a success or not that, you know, did you get a film deal off it? Did it, hit the New York Times bestseller list, did it, I don't know, did it make people happy? And that's kind of what I do. If I, if I get tons of positive responses and people love it and people have the response I want from things, 
I think it's a success. I am I am looking forward to seeing how people react to different things in this book. And fingers crossed, uh, some stuff that I planned and did will land the way I wanted it to. And so. Woo! <laughs> now it's a success. <laughs> I am there's a lot of stuff in it I mean obviously I love the whole book or I wouldn't have written it um there's there's one scene with Hector pretty early on and I won't give anything away but he basically tells Natalie when I sigh count to 10 and do this um when you get to it you will know it and I'm really proud of it because I personally I like smart characters I like writing them I like reading about them and it is a scene that shows how smart and clever and three steps ahead of everyone Hector is in it and it's one of those things I'm hoping <laughs> uh, people read that and go Oh, and like immediately flip back a page and look and suddenly realize, oh my God, this whole, he has like managed this entire interaction from the moment it began and knew exactly how it was going to play out and exactly how it was all going to go. Um, that is a moment I'm very proud of. Um, there's a bit at the end that I'm really proud of, but I can't say anything about that. <laughs> I wondered if you are building up to something in the Threshold universe, question mark, Avengers Endgame like, or is this your sandbox to play in with stories from this game? Um, I've been asked similar versions of this. I, okay, I, I think most of you have been raising your hands. I tend to write in like this weird sort of multiverse thing where I, you may see the same character or different versions of a character show up again and again in my books. You may realize wait this connects to that this is that um i don't really know if i'm setting up anything threshold wise like or threshold wise like avengers multiverse wise um i just sort of like telling stories that way i think there's something fun about i i really like myself having a story either in a tv show in a movie in a book whatever where Yes, you can just read this and it's cool, but if you've read other things, if you've seen other things, you will get that little extra, oh, the, the little Easter egg moments. And I know the Simpsons uh, called them 10 percenters, that they would put in jokes, the Simpsons writers, that they knew 90% of the audience was not going to get. But they thought it was totally worth it to have this joke that 10% of the audience would laugh hysterically at this thing that, you know, you're watching with a couple of friends and you're the only one laughing. And you think that's the greatest gag ever, but no one else gets it. And I, I kind of like that. So it's not so much building up to anything like that. Um, I would be lying if I hadn't said there are scenes I have thought of. Oh, wouldn't it be cool if this character met this character? Um, will it ever happen? I don't know. My next two books are already kind of plotted out. <laughs> So maybe somewhere down the line, when that big successful movie deal happens, and I get to. <laughs> well, looks like the chat loves the idea of Easter eggs. We have more questions in the chat, but I'm going to throw it to the audience here first, just to give them a chance. If either one of you have any anyone, here. either one of you, people watching, there are more than two people here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's four. <laughs> <laughs> But I mean, probably eventually. Um, it, like I said, I actually have. I am about sixty thousand words into a, a different time travel novel <laughs> right now, um, and then I actually have sort of a comedy horror thing I want to do after that. Um, both of both of these, I talked to my agent about, and he loves, 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 loves both of them. Uh, so those are probably going to be my immediate thing. Unless again, I see, get inspired by something from Saturday Geekery and think of something else, but probably do those. And then uh, I also have a six book series that, like an actual solid six books that I'll 
like standalone, but also tell one story if you read all of them, which we've sh tried shopping around a couple times. And yes, after all that, I might go back to the first time travel story, which I still think is a super cool idea. And, and I've written chunks of it. I just need to come up with like, like my, my editor and my agent said, I need to figure out the, the twist in it that really makes it my book. So. Nothing? Man, this is easy. <laughs> Can't believe I haven't done one of these in two years. This is so simple. <laughs> Gosh, speaking randomly and hypothetically, um, uh, I, I guess this is a good general thing. I am totally cool with people who do fan fiction, random things, whatever. The catches don't tell me about them because if you do, for a lot of stuff, I have to say no. Um, one of the things with any author, it, it's really funny because I know other authors and we talk about stuff like this all the time quietly when we meet that. Like right now, I have two of my books have actually a very major film deal set up behind them right now, which I still can't talk about and it's driving me nuts. Uh, <laughs> and uh, another one just came off another deal and somebody's kind of poking another one. But the thing is, because of these, like I could not say, gosh, if you want to do this based on that, go right ahead, because I can't because these rights have been sewn up and I do not have the ability to say that. Worse yet, if I did say that, I could possibly be in breach of contract doing it. And then that really big, cool double movie deal thing I was just talking about falls apart and they all blame me and my agent gets upset because um, we both like money. <laughs> um, so yes, that is my thing would basically be uh, if you wanted to try something officially, uh, my agent is John Kassir at Creative Artists Agency. Um, we have in the past, actually, we've done like the sort of Stephen King dollar option thing. Uh, a guy a couple of years ago, actually, up in Canada. Um, I have a short story collection and a guy optioned a short story I wrote called Mulligan um, to do as a short film for, like I think, a Canadian film festival. And we worked it out. I, I told John, I'm totally cool with it because I don't see anyone else leaping forward to do something with this. And we set up a deal with the guy and then I never heard anything again. Um, but I mean, we're willing to work with people on stuff. It's just that I have to do a lot of this. I, I have unfortunately at the point where I have to do a lot of this through official channels if, if anything wants to be actually official. So, and if not, have fun. Don't tell me about it. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you kind of answered this one, uh, but also I think uh, you can probably expand. Okay. Do you have a goal to have any of your novels picked up for a movie, series, or other format, for example, graphic novel? If so, is there a particular story you would like to see in one of the formats? Um, I mean, every every writer hopes that their book is going to get picked up. Um, the The catch is just that it's really not up to me in any sense. Um, I think really, unless we're talking about the graphic novel aspect of it, that if I, yes, I'm pretty sure there's at least two or three comic publishers I know that if I went to them and said, hey, I have decided I am going to turn this short story series into a comic book series, would you be interested? They would at least hear me out. Um, past that, you know, if I go up to Paramount and say, yes, I would like to talk to you about turning Paradox Bound into a movie, they would say, who are you? Please get away, step away from the gate. Uh, <laughs> so most of that is just like people coming to you. Um, I have had a lot of interest in my books over the years, but the simple nature of it is Hollywood is a, is a fickle beast. And uh, I mean, like, okay, famously, I think a lot of people know this, Robert Downey Jr. is a fan of 14, my novel, and he optioned it. And they wrote a script. They 
you know, paid a lot of money for it and then did absolutely nothing. Um, and the rights came back to me and another group of people tried to get it and did nothing with it. Um, there's a guy, this is actually very funny. Um, many years back, uh, this comedy writer director got in touch with me and he wanted to do the X heroes books and he had read them and he loved them. And it was really neat because he and I met and talked and it was one of those things where I've, I've had meetings in Hollywood where it's really clear that people you're talking to have never actually read your book, that someone down the line told them this would be a good book. And so they kind of want you to like feed them everything about why they should pick it up. And I sat down with this guy and he knew my books backwards and forwards. He loved them. And he was talking, about, I love this scene. I think this is amazing. I think this is great. I think this is a wonderful character trait, how you had her do this here. Um, his problem was the time he was only known as a comedy writer director and he was trying to get people to take him seriously and let him do more dramatic stuff more action stuff um and we are still in touch and it's actually very funny because now he's actually one of the biggest action directors out there um he is the guy who did uh red notice for netflix the the movie with the rock and ryan reynolds and gal gadot he wrote and directed that he did a couple other movies with Dwayne Johnson. Um, and he and I still talk and he's like, oh, someday we'll circle back to that. But I also know like, no, you're not Ross. You're not. <laughs> like you've got, people are paying him for his stuff. Why would he do my stuff? But it would be very cool and I'd be very happy. And I'm babbling again, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, internet, I'm wasting your time. on like your other quality internet time. <laughs> um. You're a notoriously massive comic book fan. Are you planning to write anything specifically with that format in mind? And uh, no, you're not a waste of time. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have toyed with a couple things of stories I want to tell and convert and sort of do them as uh, comic books instead of print novels. Um, there is an intellectual property, which I don't think this would be a shock to anyone. Uh, Rom Space Night, which is a Hasbro property, which I have wanted to write for for years. Uh, a friend of mine, Chris Royale, got to write it instead. Jerk. <laughs> nice guy. But, <laughs> um, but I know he was also a huge fan for ages. Um, and I know that right now the Hasbro rights are kind of uh, going through a shift. So I don't know. Um, wherever they land, if anyone's watching this, <laughs> um, uh, here's a funny one. <laughs> Another funny one. What really was under the concrete slab in the yard? Oh, the one out front? Wow, that was weird. Um, <laughs> yeah, so we, um, I actually have, have hit the level of success, which freaked me out, that we managed to buy a house uh, down here in San Diego. Um, I'd been up in LA, came down here. Um, and one of the things we decided after a while was it was from an era where pavement was very popular um, and concrete and all. So we decided early on we would rather have more lawn and garden space and all that. Uh, so being, you know, an intelligent, almost middle aged man, I thought I should buy a jackhammer. And I did. <laughs> and started jackhammering in our driveway, uh, including this like, weird concrete like like we had our driveway that curved up to the the garage and then there was just like this rectangular slab sticking out the side of it towards the house and it wasn't big enough to put a car in like you could maybe park a motorcycle on it or something but we're like why would anyone make a custom motorcycle spot in there so we jackhammered that up and i was going a little crazy from the heat when I was doing this over <laughs> everything. And I got bored and we had also recently uh, decided to get rid of some doors in the house and open some stuff up. And so I got bored and basically cleaned out a lot of rubble and brought one of the doors out and set it down and covered like, and then covered it back up with like concrete dust. And I took photos like, whoa, look what I found under the concrete slab. <laughs> and, <laughs> and then put all these photos up of like my hand, like, Let's see what's on the other side. Over here. <laughs> and tons of people went like, no, don't open that door. They buried it in concrete for a reason. 
And it, and it actually amazed me that apparently a lot of people honestly thought like, I had found a door under this concrete slab. Um, but no, it was, I hate to break it to you, but you all saw something on the internet that was not true. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, it had to come out sometime. <laughs> Not really. Uh, I have actually written a couple short stories where some of the characters from Paradox Bound show up again, um, including the two leads, uh, Harry and Eli. Um, but as far as a straight sequel goes, no. I, I was very happy with that just being a nice little self-contained book. Um, so. And last question from the internet, Pat. Uh, who did you find more difficult to write? Kind of spoilery, but not too much. Uh, the alcoholic ex wet work veteran or the severely traumatized orphan teenager? <laughs> um, not even a teenager, a 12 year old. Um, actually, Natalie was by far the hardest one. Um, I. This is probably like a scary thing to admit, but I had no problem with Hector whatsoever, um, including the, okay, how do I make him do this? How would I do this? Um, a lot of the stuff Hector knows are weird little facts or chains of reasoning that I know. Um, some of it is even like things I just figured out for the book of like, okay, if I was going to steal a car, which car would I pick? And Hector just walks through my thought process for it. Um, Natalie, on the other hand, was really, really tough because first draft Natalie was great. First draft Natalie was easy because um, writing a little kid and writing a lot of stuff from a little kid's perspective kind of gives you a free pass to skim over some stuff <laughs> because if the little kid isn't going to understand this, obviously they're not going to talk about it or they will explain it in simple terms. Um, especially when you're dealing with a little kid who is sort of having English as a second and a half language, sort of. Um, but then as it went on, and I hit the second draft, okay, now I have to start cleaning stuff up. Um, I became painfully aware of one, uh, as I mentioned before, almost middle-aged white guy. So telling the story of a 12-year-old Latina girl, um, was something I wanted to be very careful with uh, how I portrayed or how I had a thing, but also the fact that she had PSTSD and also just the fact that she was a girl that I do not want to write some weird, I don't want to write the 50 year old white guy version of what a 12 year old girl is. Um, so through this, my my partner, a bunch of my female friends are writers, fielded a lot of really weird and probably in a general sense, very creepy questions that you can only get away with when you're a writer and you have to ask, so when did you first notice this? How old were you? Um, that sort of stuff. But it was also like, I wanted to know, I wanted to get this right. I didn't, I didn't want either of these characters to be a joke in either way. And I wanted to make sure that they worked so, yeah, Natalie was by far the harder character to write of the two of them. Hector was great because Hector doesn't like talking a lot and it's easy to write action. So, anything from the audience? I can't believe you're all this satisfied with the. Was that a hint? Probably the biggest thing, I know one thing I, I keep going back to is artificial intelligence. Um, I know uh, Chuck Wendig just wrote a beautiful Wanderers and the Upcoming Wayward, fantastic books that involve, have a strong AI element. Um, I was a huge fan of, I don't know if any of you saw it, there was a show on for a couple of years called Person of Interest which they they sort of disguised as a, oh, it's a crime drama show. And then like at the end of first season, we find out, no, you've been watching a sci-fi show all along. This is actually a show about artificial intelligence and what it does to the world and what it means to the world. 
Um, again, weird people I know, I actually know this futurist named Mike Walsh, who is very big into AI. Um, you can find his videos online talking about artificial intelligence and business and stuff. He actually helped me with this. Uh, at one point, he's in Australia right now, but we got on the on Zoom. And uh, one of the things that, that struck me, and so I was talking with him about it, is uh, there's a thing called a Turing test, um, which is basically, if you're not familiar with it, uh, it's a test to see, is a machine actually thinking or is it acting like it's thinking? Um, there's also another version of it called the Chinese room test, which is kind of the same idea, trying to figure out is is this machine actually doing something or is it process, just mechanically processing something? And the idea I had, which will come up at one point in this book, I don't think this would really be spoilery, is that I was talking to Mike about, could you do a Turing test on a ghost? that could you tell is this ghost actually conscious and self-aware or is it just sort of like frozen memories that are replaying something again and again um and he thought that was fascinating we talked for a little while on that on how would how would this work how would you do i mean ignoring the how would you talk to a ghost thing but how would you apply a turing test to a ghost and that was really fun i would love to do something with artificial intelligence at some point um i'm actually playing with a short story that is all about right now for a, um a, a collection called the reinvented detective which i think is going to be out next year um which is sort of an anti-ai story but at some point that's probably like like i said i've got like the next eight books planned out but somewhere after that and after going back to the time travel story um it might be interesting to do something with artificial intelligence and so Anything else? I have more chat questions already, uh, but I will ask just one more. Um, I have so many questions. I could do this all day, as a man said. <laughs> um, so Max asked, ask, oh my God. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what question does no one ever ask you that you wish they would? And what would be your answer? That is a joke question. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, I could come up with a dozen things about like, I, I could just like throw out a bunch of questions and leave you all wondering what are the answers to these? Like, you know, is it true that you once portrayed an ostrich on a TV show? Or um, why did federal agents hold you at gunpoint that time? Or, you know, is it true that you smuggled exotic animals across an international border once? And any one of those could be an interesting story to answer but i never get asked them so and i guess we're done now so all right internet people i'm going to cut it off here because we're getting to the tiny portion of our event thank you so much for being here and i hope you have a good evening bye everyone thank you for coming sort of <laughs>